Okay, so we got through um, our morning presentations to try to get us on a baseline about the organic marketplace, what it means to be certified organic, what that process is, a little bit about how to make sense of the regulation and some of the resources uh, to help producers getting into organic. Okay, I know we didn't have a chance to talk through what that actually looks like on the ground. We'll get to see that at Andy's farm this afternoon. But then I also wanted to have this panel to bring a broader voice of people in the organic community here in Indiana, uh, representing different types of enterprises, um, different businesses, different kinds of farms, uh, so that you can, you know, they'll tell us some things briefly here about themselves and what they do in, in the organic sector. Uh, but then I wanna open it up to all of you to ask questions uh, based on some of the things we d discussed this morning. Okay, so fair enough. All right, so on our panel, we've got Eric Bryan with Bryan Farms. It's in Adams, Northern Adams County, right? Uh, central and Southern, right in the okay. middle. Okay, okay. Yeah. Almost to Ohio. And we have Ross Smith with Organic Valley, Colton Yoder with Miller Poultry, Pete Lehman with, what's your farm's name? Uh, Sunrise Acres. Sunrise Acres, okay, and Kelly Diaz with Wolf Co-op. Okay, so I'll give each of them an opportunity, uh, ask them just to introduce themselves, talk briefly about their operation, business, whatever their affiliation is, um, provide some details, and then we'll, we'll go with questions. Okay. Start with Eric. Uh, like you said, I'm Eric Bryan, uh, Monroe, Indiana, and uh, I guess I'm the organic grain farmer of the, of the bunch. Uh, we do uh, corn, soybeans, wheat, uh, and do hay uh, as also, and then uh, do uh, custom manure business, uh, mainly poultry litter, and then uh, kind of doing a little bit of uh, fabrication work and uh, started building some weed flamers, We're working on some uh, weed flamer designs and different burner designs right now, and going to try doing a little bit of that. I guess I got two orders for next year for weed flamers, and I don't really even make them yet so but I've, I've put put together a few for some other people so I guess I'm in the business and uh, so could you tell us a little bit about how you guys manage your production you know just some basics about rotation and okay. things like that um, I guess as far as uh, transitioning the acre or transitioning the acres um, in the past before we were organic we did a lot of hay uh, so uh, we we for the most part, transition our acres in alfalfa, and then uh, coming out, uh, uh, we'll do corn our first year. Uh, but uh, also, uh, we've had some in where we'll just do like uh, soybean or soybeans the first year, then the second year we'll do wheat, and then uh, clover or a good cover crop, legume cover crop to get us to our first uh, organic corn year. So uh, as we as we expand more and uh, pick up more acres, that's kind of the way things are, are moving for us is uh, is doing that rotation rather than the hay. Uh, I guess we we got a lot of uh, big buildings for hay, but uh, we have some other ideas of what we're going to do, use those buildings for. So I don't foresee us having a whole lot more room than just equipment s storage pretty soon here. So uh, we're kind of kind of moving away from the from the hay and straw a little bit, and you know toward more towards organic uh, grain production and. Uh, uh, so once you once you have a field that's certified, do you maintain that that three-year rotation, or, or what are some of the uh, yeah, things you guys are? Yeah, generally, uh, I guess we're kind of a corn-heavy rotation, uh, but uh, we 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 get wheat in every now and then. Uh, it it never really pays to have the have wheat uh, that year. It doesn't seem, but uh, the corn that we get after a, a, a clover uh, cover crop or a legume cover crop, I mean, we have generally our best best corn after a legume like that so uh, if we gain 20 30 bushel on our on our corn crop I mean that kind of you know helps pay for the for the wheat year that we might you know not not have a tremendous profit on so uh, uh, but yeah uh, normally uh, corn soybean and then uh, I don't know uh, about every other rotation we'll throw wheat in there uh, it's kind of what it seems seems like, and then uh, we do have a few uh, organic acres that uh, we'll put put hay back into, uh, just to kind of keep a customer base happy uh, and uh, 
keep some hay, organic hay, and then uh, it kind of seems like uh, with using so much manure and stuff, uh, we have some farms that are getting high in calcium too, and uh, to grow it out with hay is kind of the, the, the best option there because corn and soybeans don't really uh, take that much calcium away. So uh, I guess with, with being organic, we're not using a tremendous amount of acidic fertilizers and stuff to, to take the calcium levels down. So uh, we, we're getting some pretty high pHs, uh, and uh, we're, we're using, using hay for that also. <clears throat> So just to round it out, could you talk a little bit about your markets, where you're taking some of these crops? Um, yeah, there's, I, you know, people people that are getting started with organic are like, well, we have to truck it to Illinois, or, you know, the there's no markets close. It's, it's I'd say at least half the people we sell to, I mean, they offer a, a picked up at the farm price. Um, so, I mean, if you have grain storage, I mean, pretty much anybody, if, in, you know, if, if you don't have the means to, to haul it, I mean, if, if you mentioned uh, picking it up at the farm, I mean, I'd say uh, Wolf Co-op I would probably do that, and uh, you know, pretty much pretty much anybody we deal with, uh, you know, they're they're willing to truck it. But uh, yeah, we sell a lot. Uh, grain Millers, uh, Agricor and Marion there uh, is doing uh, organic uh, food grade, and then uh, we've sold some soybeans to to Miller Poultry before. And then uh, real cl close to us uh, in Rockford, Ohio, so it's just 20 miles away, uh, uh, Kalmbach Feeds, is uh, they do their bean meal there. They have a press press style for bean meal or whatever. So that's a good close close market for us for our soybeans. But then we sell quite a bit of corn uh, to, to uh, Kalmbach's and take it up to Upper Sandusky. So, I mean, there's there's a lot of options, and, I mean, it's it's definitely growing. I mean... Uh, the infrastructure, I think, you know, will continue to grow, and I mean, locally, there's not, not, you know, like any anybody doing feed and that kind of stuff uh, in Adams County, which, with us being such a Amish, you know, so many Amish in our county, and it's funny, whenever you showed your map earlier, like, you know, LaGrange and all that, there's tons of dots up there, and uh, getting to be Wayne, Wayne and Randolph County, uh, quite a bit of dots around there, and then over the other side of the state, uh, around uh, Crawfordsville there, I mean, there's, there's quite a few, and it's like, wow, the south half of Adams County, I think, is the most populated, you know, area in the state for Amish, and it's like, they just aren't really yeah. jumping on board as fast as, as other areas, so... Um, I know Colm Box has uh, showed a little bit of interest in, you know, putting something in that area. But the few that are uh, Amish that are producing uh, grain and a little bit of livestock now, I mean, uh, I, yeah, I don't know if that's enough for them to, you know, to to create infrastructure. But they, Colm Box did buy uh, Monroe grain there in Monroe, so right now it's just conventional. So, uh, you know, eventually that might be, you know, what their thought process is, but. Yeah. Now, how about on the hay when you have certified organic hay? Because one of the things I've heard that's uh, some farmers who, who want to incorporate hay, that perennial phase in a rotation, which can be really helpful from a soil standpoint and nitrogen and all that, they're just not finding solid markets for organic hay because of competition from out west. Yeah, stuff that's definitely. I mean, with fuel being a little bit cheaper right now, uh, I can't blame any of our customers for getting the hay from out west I mean we just don't yep. grow hay in Indiana like they do out west I yep. mean uh, uh, for us 150 RFVs you know exceptional hay and uh, you know they're getting 180 200 RFV trucked in from from out west and you know for the same price or you know just a little bit more I mean uh, I guess you got to go back to nutrients and uh, and economics uh, so uh, yeah uh, we can we can normally sell our really good quality hay no problem though and uh seems like we can sell junk pretty good but the middle of the road hay like we always seem to be growing especially on a year like this you know we just can't grow that top quality hay and we're not getting a bunch of rain but it's just like uh, like our th third cut we we just mailed last week and it was three weeks after we were supposed to mow it because it rained every three days for a month straight there but uh it, it was as decent quality hay but as humid as it was and much ground moisture i mean it took us a full week to get it up and it looks like rained at, rained on hay even though it didn't get rain so uh you know that's just it'll it's this more hay that 
you know, it'll go somewhere eventually, but, you know, the premium over conventional, uh, you know, it's not our corn, you know, is three times more than what conventional corn is and at least, and, you know, hey, it might might fetch, you know, twenty twenty five dollars a ton more. I mean, but really, I, I don't really see much of a premium in the hay. I mean, there's times there's times where it is. I mean, whenever for whatever reason, the area that you sell to uh, has a bad hay year or, you know, something like that. But there's there's times where it, it goes fast and it's worth a lot. But yeah, I'll agree with what you say. I mean, it's, it seems like uh, the hay has been a little it's it's a little slow. And that's kind of why we were, you know, phase, phasing away from it. But, you know, like I said, there's a handful of customers we don't want to completely, you know, leave out and, you know, knowing how good hay is for rotation. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Ready? Let's go to Ross. So just keep your question, hold your questions, okay, until we get through everybody's yeah, introductory so remarks. I'm Ross Smith. I work for Crop, uh, Crop Cooperative, which is more recognized with our brands of dairy products um, labeled under Organic Valley. We also have a meat division called Organic Prairie. Um, our company was started back in, or our co-op was started back in 1985 by a group of seven farmers, a couple of which had ponytails, uh, <laughs> a couple of which were just good old boys from Wisconsin. Um, that's where our corporate headquarters is located. Uh, our co-op now entails a little over 2,015 farmers nationwide. Um, as the Indiana Regional Pool Manager, I manage about 190 farms in the state overall. Uh, you, you manage those farms or the farmers manage you? The farmers manage the farms and I'm, I'm the go-between <laughs> the co-op. <laughs> Twice a day. <laughs> Twice a day I'm there milking cows. No. Um, our pools in Indiana uh, at this point include hog production as well as dairy production. I don't believe that we have any uh, grain growers, however, that is a pool of farmers that our uh, co-op has, our grain producers around the United States, and many of those western hay producers uh, belong to our co-op as well. Uh, we do have an egg division. It's mostly located out of Ohio um, and Wisconsin. Um, we have not moved that egg division into Indiana uh, at this point. Um, we do have some, as far as the dairy market goes, we're in a definite slowdown. Um, as most of the dairy industry is right now, we've certainly uh, been affected by it. At this time, uh, we're not procuring milk in the state. Um, at a time that we can, uh, we certainly will have uh, the interest. Um, the interest within the state is, is ever growing and I get multiple calls every week. So, um, so you mean you're not taking on additional Not taking on supply. additional farms. Yep, yep. Yeah. Um, however, our produce division of the company um, is expanding in the state of Indiana. In fact, they're specifically looking um, here in the state of Indiana uh, for produce procurement. So as uh, those of you who work out uh, in extension throughout the counties are approached by potential produce growers, that's definitely an opportunity we'd like for you to share with them um, and direct them towards us. Uh, we do have kind of a minimum requirement. We don't want every you know, two acre truck farm, unfortunately, for our production model. Um, we usually have about 12 acre um, minimums for certain produce production that we look for. Um, however, we, we do like to, you know, take any inquiries and, and judge them uh, as they come. So I think, yeah, okay. actually that's, that's the elevator pitch. There we go. <laughs> okay, let's pass it to Colton then. All right, again, my name's Colton Yoder. Um, I work for Miller Poultry. Um, I, I guess I wear a lot of hats at the company, but my main job title is broiler support technician. Um, <clears throat> so I'm in charge. Well, first off, I've got about 25 farms that I service on a weekly basis. Uh, one of your other customers happens to be one of them. Um, and that's a part of my job I really enjoy. It's basically going out to the farms once a week, checking on bird health, um, checking on feed quality, uh, and basically all environmental quality in the barn, making sure that all animal welfare practices are being followed, and that includes all organic standards are being followed, um, and making sure that we're in compliance with what we say we are. We're, we're a company that prides ourselves on doing what we say we do. Um, <clears throat> other parts of my job, um, I'm in charge, of, in charge of all of our company tours, 
um, and also uh, starting off new growers. If you put up a brand new barn for us, um, I show you how all your equipment works and how to raise birds and how to run the ventilation controller and all that type of stuff. So, um, Miller poultry, we've got around between 200 and 215 barns, uh, between about 160 growers, uh, about 30% of which is organic. The rest is antibiotic free or ABF. Um, we process in total around 750,000 birds a week. Um, our processing plants in Orland, um, and we've got a we're what you'd call a completely vertically integrated. Uh, so just new what I guess it's been two years now. Um, we just started our own breeder operation, which is up in Vandalia, Michigan. So we've got our own breeder operation to lay the eggs. We've got our own hatchery, which is in Goshen, um, and then our feed mill is in New Paris. And then we've got our own processing plant. So that's a pretty neat, uh, neat. It's it was neat when I first started here. We didn't have, uh, didn't have the breeders yet, and so we're sourcing in all of our eggs from, uh, from Arkansas or other companies. And now we have control over that, which is which is a neat, uh, neat feat for the company. So, so I have two questions for you. Then could you talk about um, how new growers come on with mm -hmm. you guys? What that process looks like, and then second. Um, what do you see as some of the main differences between your, uh, I don't like, I don't want to say conventional because it's not quite conventional production, but it's, it's non-organic production versus your organic production physically and management wise. What, what do you see as some of the main differences? Okay. So first question, how, how do we acquire new growers? So I know probably in the past, we've probably done some types of ads. Most of it is word of mouth. Um, as you saw on that map on there uh, of all the dots <laughs> of all the organic farms, you know, a lot of those are, are ours too. So there's a lot of uh, communication back and forth with, with our grower base. And, you know, so we get a lot of calls on guys wanting to put up new barns for us. And as long as we're, you know, still trending upward in our production, then we'll try to accommodate and fit that in. Um, and then uh, second question, differences between antibiotic free and organic programs. Um, there's a lot more paperwork with our organic programs. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's definitely the truth. Um, so first off, all of our farms for Miller Poultry are certified through a Global Animal Partnership, or it's called GAP certification. It's a tiered system from um, uh, one to a five, uh, step one to a five, um, for animal welfare reasons. And then um, we're also certified uh, for organic on all of our organic farms. So our 30% of our farms, which comes to, it's probably right around 60, 60 barns or so. Um, they not only have organic certification, they also have a global animal partnership step two certification as well. Um, so part of the organic side of things, uh, they have to be re required to have 75% um, square footage for outdoor access. Um, there's a new lighting requirement that we have to follow for this year, which uh, measures the intensity of the light for the birds. That would be a gap. Um, that that would be a gap. Gap, a gap standard. Yep. Um, we have shade structures in our outdoor access areas. Um, uh, all of the organic barns. Um, there's a temperature requirement for when the birds are supposed to be let out, and an age requirement. Um, it's set for 28 days right now. We let our birds out at, at 18 days old, um, and they really, from my experience, and from seeing the organic birds. Uh, a lot more birds go outside when you open the doors up at day 18, assuming the weather conditions are, are suitable outside. A lot more birds go out at the younger age than wait until 28 days when the requirement starts. So that's what's, you know, you start to get into, into what on the animal on the animal agriculture side, what is perceived as an organic production from a customer standpoint who's buying the chicken in the store and what our standpoint is. You know, there could be someone who's looking at buying the chicken and they see it's organic. I think it's automatically your mind goes to, you know, probably everyone would say pasture raised, sunshine and, and, you know, outside all the time where that's not how the bird was naturally developed over time or domesticated. They, they prefer a lot more um, shaded structure. They do go outside, they love going outside. There'll be thousands of them out there, which is, which is excellent. Um, but there, a lot of people don't know that there's an age requirement on it to keep the bird healthy and safe. Mm. Okay. Yeah, so that's one clarification on the organic standard from a poultry standpoint. <clears throat> the, 
they don't have to be on pasture, but they do have to have outdoor access. That, that's so, so how a pult an organic poultry farm manifests itself is a huge spectrum. Mm -hmm. So you could have very large, uh, what looks like a normal confinement facility uh, that will have basically porches that are screen, like a screen porch mm -hmm. in essence, situated around the barn. So that's their outdoor access, okay? So they can get fresh air, they can get some exposure to the sun. It might be a dirt thing where they can scratch around. Or it could be something that you envision as like a true pastured poultry where they're on pasture being moved regularly. So how, how that manifests on a give, given farm looks different mm -hmm. between It goes operations. back to that fluidity in what the standard is, yep. how it's written and everything. Mm -hmm. But all of ours are, are all pasture. We don't have anything that's strictly gravel or anything like that. Everything is has organic seed put down if it's available. If we can find organic seed, we actually this year started putting in um, organic oregano. Uh, planting those at our new organic farms um, because or, or oregano and oregano essential oils um, are good for uh, health of the bird, uh, for their uh, digestive system, helps them process feed and everything like that. We've used it in some of our feeds sometimes too, so that's kind of interesting. Okay. I'll talk all day if you let me. Great. Great. No, okay. <laughs> well, let's, let's move on and then we can, we can get questions. So, Pete? Okay, like I said, I'm Pete Lehman from uh, North Central Indiana. Uh, ship Shawana Middlebury area dairy farmer uh, we got like I said in introductions we got certified in 2006 uh, we kind of led up to that uh, I started farming in 86 with my dad so we had a partnership for 10 years started our rotational grazing in 92 and then we looked into on-farm processing and that kind of led us into the organic thing uh, we went out took a trip out east Kind of interesting. I think Jack Laser's picture in one of those books. We were at that farm, uh, checking out the on-farm processing. So after we got back from that, we decided we're gonna probably move on into the organics. Uh, we wanted something. Uh, we're looking for something special or something different, uh, not the regular non-organic dairies, because of the roller coaster prices and well, we just thought there was probably a better way of doing it so that's what we were looking for. In 2003 we decided uh, to transition. We first looked into it in 2000, uh, late uh, 90s and it looked impossible but 2003 we kind of changed our mind. We went for it. Organic Valley we were talking with them and they told us we could transition but they would not guarantee us a market. So uh, 15 of us farmers decided we're going to go for it. Uh, take a chance because we wanted to fit a semi. Uh, tanker. So we did, and by the time we got transitioned and uh, ready for the truck, there was different people there asking for our milk. So that's kind of how we got into uh, uh, the organic production. And now I'm right now, uh, what is that, uh, 15? No, 12 years later. I got my son on the farm now, uh, starting uh, succession. He's on the farm now two years, so eventually we'll get there. So that's basically where I'm at. Uh, we're milking uh, between 55 and 60 cows. We like to be up to 70 to 80 cows, but we've uh, got our quota right now. And I didn't factor all that in when we uh, took our son you know, home on the farm. So we're uh, de uh, definitely trying to make our steps count here with, uh, with where we're at in the milk market. Uh, our farm, home farm, uh, consists of uh, 114 acres tillable. I mean, we're renting a farm down the road that's 60 acres where we got our heifers. Uh, we, uh, our uh, crops, we usually raise around 30 acres of corn and uh, about, I don't know, don't add them all up because they probably won't for, add For grain or for silage? The, uh, for silage mostly. Uh, usually we have some to for dry corn, but I think this year we're chopping everything. And about 30 to 40 acres in hay, and the rest is uh, balances in pasture, which will include some sorghum sedan and uh, turnips in our rotation. For our rotation to get to uh, corn, we usually in the fall and August, we'll till up uh, with a rotor tiller, till up uh, about 10 acres of hay ground and put uh, 
turnips and oats in there, which that will be grazed off in the uh, latter part of October and November. And then next spring, and that will we get a lot of our manure on there. Well, not all of it, but quite a bit of it. And next spring, we'll go in early and uh, seed oats in there. And once the oats get up to about knee high, we'll till that back in and it goes back into corn. Uh, we'll go into corn for the first year. <clears throat> Usually we have uh, two to three years uh, of corn, which they say one year, right? <laughs> But well, we usually it's rye behind, you know, there's a cover crop in between. We don't go corn stalks on corn again. Yeah. I mean, we've got to, and I think that's important. So that's two to three years in corn. Then it goes back into the uh, alfalfa grass mix for hay production. Uh, I guess that pretty well covers our operation. And I assume you talked about getting into rotational grazing well before you got into organic, I assume that that aspect of your operation is still really important. Yes, it is. It's yeah. very important. We do, uh, we do that. Yeah, that's, when we started grazing in 92, that was a new thing, and you kind of watch where you did it so people didn't talk quite as much about you as <laughs> they could have. And that's kind of what, what had happened when we went uh, organic. We were one of the first farmers uh, that uh, transitioned to organic. And like I told Ross, we didn't say organic, we whispered organic when we talked, because yeah. there was not a lot of support there. And this being here today, I just want to add this. I really appreciate this. This is really a, a great feeling for me to be here with so much support or interest in organic, which I hadn't seen in, in my time when we started. And now we got things in place. If uh, Somebody transitions to organic. They got the they get the paperwork to fill out. Uh, a couple of neighbors get together with them, sit down, and they show their number, show their papers, what they wrote down, give them ideas. And usually, within a it doesn't take long. By the next year, he's got that paper to look back on, and it's just a huge things. We've got our support groups uh, up there where if you want to transition, uh, they let us know, and we'll go on the farm and. We'll walk them through what we did to get started, and the mistakes we made, and that's why I mentioned the seed tags, that the earlier the better, because once we want to get certified, where's all your seed tags? Oh, well, I don't have any seed tags. Mm -hmm. So we had to go back and get all the tags. And uh, So I think uh, the organic part has been really uh, an interesting venture in my farming career. Uh, what I've seen happen through the 80s where you did your own thing, you didn't share anything to where we're at now. If farmers want to do something, we get together, we talk about it, we share ideas, uh, equipment. Uh, I've got probably, oh, without counting, probably seven, seven organic farmers within, a, within two miles of me. Yeah. So it's a great thing. Yeah, I, I, it's just really helped out our community as far as uh, us uh, smaller farmers staying in business. It really has. Good, good. Yeah, and I think a, a couple things I just want to follow up on there. You know, he talked about how this, as that community has moved more into organic, that support network system has grown with it. And I think that's something for, for those of us in areas of the state where there isn't a lot of organic activity, we're have, we'll have to be more intentional about how we can help support these farmers and connect them with others to create that support network. It's gonna be more geographic, geographically dispersed, right? But we can help make those connections. And that's a lot of what I find myself doing right now. Um, and then the, I was trying to think of the, the second thing that I wanted to follow up on. Uh, oh, darn it, slipped my, my mind. Maybe it'll come back, but okay. Thank you, Pete. Let's hear from Kelly about Wolf Co-op. Kelly Diaz from Wolf Co-op. Um, Wolf started off as just a small feed mill, Wookettville feed mill. Um, and then in 2011, we had about 80 producers get together and come up with this vision um, on how we help local farmers um, keep the organic business going and start setting our children up for the future. Um, 
So they got together, elected about five people to be on a panel. Um, and then that's where they came up with Wolf, Wolf Co-op. Um, Wolf had a reputation for high quality organic feed and it was one of the few places in the area. Um, now we currently, we just purchased a Honeyville and a Center Ag, which Center Ag um, does organic fertilizers. So that's up and coming. Um, organic is extremely important in our community. Um, Pete is part of that area. So we have a lot of people coming on board if they're not sure what to do. Um, our company kind of helps them out, gives them ideas, directs them in the right area. Um, the big thing with Wolf is they just want to secure organic farming and profitability for future generations um, and make sure that the prices stay low and they can just, they can make it affordable to be organic, not make it so hard to become organic. Could you talk a little bit about the actual uh, facility and the operation? Um, what kind of grains your wolf, wolf is, is needing more supply of? We always need corn. <laughs> corn, corn. Um, <laughs> wolf, uh, we do corn, rye, barley, very little wheat, um, soybeans, soy meal. Uh, we try to do as much local purchasing as we can. Um, we currently just put up another feed bin, or a storage bin, excuse me, um, because we're growing so fast, so rapidly. Um, we just put in a roaster and a sheller. We do send out wagons because we have such um, a large Amish community. We will send wagons to the facilities to pick up the corn for them. And then we make feed, organic feed for pretty much Anything. Us. Yeah, <laughs> Miller Poultry is a huge, huge customer. We do grain banks, um, speaking of Miller. Um, yeah, so who, so aside from Miller, who are your biggest customers uh, in terms of the feed? Is it dairy farms or no? no. Oh, yeah, it would be Stagecoach, um, Natural Family Farms. We do a lot of poultry um, feed, but we also do horse, goats, turkeys, you name it. Uh, Crystal Creek, we work hand in hand with Crystal Creek um, and their nutritionist to make sure that our, our ideas and what we're trying to do um, make sense and they give us ideas on what products to use for the best result. Okay. Thank from, you. From personal experience, just because I, I see it every day and, and you know, because we use it, so it's very good. All right, so my, my last question uh, before I turn it over to you all for, for your questions, I'd like to ask Pete just to talk about his experience, because you're currently, you mentioned you're on the board of the co-op. I don't know if you could expand on that a little bit. Oh, well, how this all started, uh, I guess I was one of the people that decided we needed a co-op there to get this thing going. Because of, uh, of all the uh, dairy farmers we had and no place to buy a calf starter or heifer feed or dairy ration, you know, it's just, and Lamar Bontre, that the owner of uh, Bocaville, the, the feed mill there, he was starting to grind some, but it was just, it was just a tough move forward. Uh, so we formed a co-op and started that. And uh, we started in 2011. We, got together and they elected five of us uh, to move forward with us with that so we didn't by 2013 uh, we formed the co-op the co-op was formed uh, Bob White from uh, from uh, Indiana Farm Bureau I don't know if you guys know him or not he is the guy that really worked with us uh, really close he got us through all the hoops and so forth and we bought the mill in 2013 three months later after we Bought the mill that ground uh, burnt to the ground. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
Jeez. So we had a, yeah, when Lamar walked into the, walked into the barn that morning, I was milking. I thought somebody had died because Maddie had a long face. Uh, he says, you know what, Pete, our mill burnt to the ground. Said, Are you kidding? <laughs> oh. So we had a board meeting by 9 o'clock. Had everybody there and had to decide what to do. So uh, we went to another building up on the hill, that metal building, and uh, decided to uh, install a state-of-the-art uh, computerized mill. So that's what we got now. And uh, just to give you a little bit of an idea, when we started, it was like uh, a seven, I'm thinking $700,000 business. And we're between 13 and 14 million today. So we grew at a tremendous rate, uh, very challenging, still is. Uh, wouldn't have been for Miller, I don't know if we'd have survived or not. But so far as the dairy part goes, uh, when we started this, we really did this for the dairy people but we'd have depended on the dairy people, we'd have, we'd have never made it. Because the dairy and the organics, uh, the dairy people, they want to be self-sufficient. I mean, that is their goal. They want to grow everything they feed, particularly in our area. So uh, that's, uh, then the poultry business came on. We happened to be at the right place at the right time. The poultry business was just expanding rapidly, and we right with them. So last year we put in a new uh, bin at 125,000 bushel bin, and this year we put in a, it's not quite done yet, I don't think. The, the bin is the leg and the, the dumping pit, uh, the pit, receiving pit. Another 250,000 bushel bin uh, with a receiving pit where we can unload grain a lot faster because we were getting 30 semis a day, and we just, it was just uh, something else. So, uh, that's kind of where we're at. Uh, we're looking at a possibly a pelleter before too long, uh, if finances allow us to do it. Uh, so it has been an interesting trip. Uh, and and I don't know if you could clarify, but in my last conversation where I brought this topic up with Lamar, despite the fact that we have growing organic activity, it's predominantly on the demand side but not on the supply side. And Wolf has still been dependent on some of those imports. We right? really need a lot of domestic grain. We've got a capacity there that we could use a lot of grain. I don't yeah. know how much Miller imported. Of course, I don't, I see some numbers, but I don't see them all and I don't remember. It doesn't matter, but like I said, 46% of it got imported. For the nation. For the nation. Yeah. You know, and we really need local grain. We like to, we like at the mill, Wolf, we talk about it. We like to say we've got all domestic grain here, but we don't have it. I mean, we just yep. don't have it. But it's really increased. It's it's really coming on. It is. Yep. Yep. We're hearing a lot of hearing a lot of people say the same thing. That they went all domestic, and you know, it's just it's not there. But things are. I guess there's definitely room for more. Yeah. For more. All right, so let's let's turn it to Q and A, and Ed, you'll be dancing around with the mic. I know it's kind of annoying, and you guys, please, please pass the mic back and forth so that we can capture the audio. So, questions, or, or are we all falling into food comas <laughs> after Nadine's catering? Lunch was delicious. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> So uh, I, I a okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sing a pattern. Okay, this question is actually for Ross. Um, you mentioned on the uh, uh, veg crop to reduce the minimum size. You're looking at 12 acres. Do you work any with aggregators? With what? Aggregators. No, I'm not familiar with the term. Yeah, around the 12 acres. Yeah, Cert, uh, certainly in several of the uh, smaller Amish communities that we work with with produce production around the United States, that has become the model. 
Um, much many of those operations are smaller than 12 acres. Uh, as we go into the future here and, and, and looking for efficiency, um, we are pushing to find larger and larger vegetable producers. However, something like that may definitely not be out of the question in the future. Okay, I, I have a question. Um, I was on a trip uh, with the SARE program out to, out to Oregon uh, back in June, and one of the farms that we visit is an organic valley farm, uh, and they moved into being a grass milk producer. And I've heard that that's a rapidly growing part of, within the organic valley portfolio, still a small part of it, but it, there's demand. I don't know if you could yeah. expand on that. Yeah, so <clears throat> there's lots of conversation that goes on within the organic world. Um, we have outfacing discussions, and then we have what we call dining room table discussions between the family. And uh, the 30% dry matter from pasture um, requirement that the NLP has for ruminant animals um, is something that has wound up um, being able to be uh, done by larger farms, uh, you know, lum numbers into the couple of thousand head around the United States, depending on where you are. Um, part of Organic Valley's mission is to uh, ensure the future of the small uh, dairy farm in the United States, primarily under 50 head. So as we've looked at this uh, ability for managers around the United States to be able to achieve this 30% pasturing requirement in larger and larger numbers, thus driving down the dairy prices, we've looked for another niche um, market, and that's driven us to the 100% grass-fed dairy market. Um, we're currently the largest supplier of 100% grass-fed milk in the United States. Uh, we sell it under the brand name Grass Milk um, at, a, at a premium above organics. And um, those producers, uh, as you know, like the description uh, provides there, are feeding 100% grass, uh, you know, including you know, winter production uh, there. Uh, it has to be seed free, uh, seed and grain free. So it's certainly a way of management that takes a significant increased amount of education and management. Um, currently in Indiana, we don't have any of, we don't have a market uh, officially. We do have producers who are voluntarily doing that. Um, but that product also has paid a premium on top of the organic premium that we supply our farmers. Pete, if, I mean, you may want to touch more on that. Pass them. I don't know what to want to say about the grass milk. We're not producing grass milk, so. Okay. Well, uh, if you don't have any follow-on comments, that's fine. That's fine. No, I, I, the, 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 about the grass milk, it's always interesting. Uh, my thoughts on the grass milk is maybe that is our next uh, niche market. Yeah. Uh, with, the fam uh, with the size farms we got in our community, uh, we're not looking at milking 200, 300, 500, or 1,000 cows. Uh, so for us, you know, we might have to look at it. I'm, I'm kind of, I don't know, I guess maybe I'm getting too old to change my ways. I don't know. Uh, when I was young, I was always waiting for that next challenge. That's for your and, son. And, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. You know, it, it might be the way to go. I don't know yet. I'm, I'm watching and listening, and I think it can be done because it's being done. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad it's there, uh, and I, that's something we can do that the 500 cow can't. Dairy can't do because of uh, all grass. So I'm hopeful. I'm glad it's there. Okay. Good. John. Uh, Kelly, uh, you're not too far from the area that I work, and there's really not a lot of organic producers in the area that I work. How does somebody get connected with you? And what are the two or three steps that you have to go through to get, get somebody who's marketing to bring to you? So what would you, I'm sorry, are so you? So his question is just, if, if someone wants to get into selling organic grains to Wolf Co-op, what's that look like? Oh yeah, is it um, 
Ms. Collis, you'll talk to um, probably General Lamar. Um, they will talk to you about contract options, um, floating contracts or set contracts. Um, we will require a grain sample and then we will test it for purity and toxins and we'll get that on file once that's done and the contract um, stuff is done then you start bringing us your grain. It's pretty simple. Um, I can connect, I'll give you a card before we leave. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean once we have, once we cover you with the contract, make sure you're getting paid what you need to get paid and then we assure that your product is indeed organic and meets our standards and it's fairly simple from that point on. And are you guys doing it in your sampling, grain sampling and specs, are you, do you have a certain threshold on purity from a GMO standpoint? Because I know some, some processors do, some don't. It just depends on their market. Nothing over five. Nothing, Nothing over five percent. Yeah. Um, we try to keep it lower, um, but with the purchase of Honeyville, they are a non-GMO um, feed mill. So if for some reason you test too high, we may refer you to Honeyville because they may need your grain. We won't just say sorry, good luck, see you next year. Um, we, we've got different options there. So from, that, from the grain standpoint, when we talk about purity, um, GMO, contamination, um, the standard doesn't say anything about that, right? We can't plant organ uh, GMO seed, but in terms of what ha what's in that final product, that's not really addressed in the standard. But a lot of markets have threshold standards. Uh, if they're also part of non-GMO verified, they'll have to meet those. And that's like for food grade 99.5, I believe, and feed grade is 95%, I believe. So most grain buyers are sampling and have a certain threshold on GMO specs. So the 5% that comes from bubble drip or something like that? Yeah. Or if the seed, the initial seed may not be 100% pure. Probably the most issues you have is too close to a con sorry problem that I that we see at our feed mill because we do we test to uh, for non-GMO because all of our feed is either non-GMO or or organic and the problem that you have is you got a guy who has a field right next to a conventional field and you've got cross pollination happening and then they bring it in and then we test it and if it's over five percent then we have to reject it we can't take it and so that causes a lot of frustration, especially for someone if they went and switched over to, to non-GMO from conventional and then they're not able to sell it as that. Yeah, but, but also I'd, I'd stress that the seed purity is also not always there. Um, and I know some, some farms that are focused on food grade corn production and they're testing every seed lot that they get, regardless of what the tag says on that seed lot, they're testing it because that in market doesn't care what happened with your seed source. So to add to that, you know, it comes back to the, the farmer is responsible. Like you were saying, you know, uh, we can't blame anybody else but ourselves. If the guy, if Michael said it's okay and, and it's not okay and I used it, it's still my fault. You won't do business with me again. On <laughs> <laughs> the uh, production side, obviously your, your grains demand a premium when you sell them. So that comes at a cost of a, of a less, lesser yield, I would assume. So what, what's the threshold to, for it to still be profitable? Uh, this year, I could grow 70 bushel corn at 11, 770 an acre, 200 bushel corn at three and a half, 700. So I think we're good there. Uh, our cost of production is similar. Um, we're, some of our farms that we've had in organic longer, uh, we've kind of kind of backed off a little bit. But uh, if we if we take on a new farm and we know we're going to have it for a while, I mean, we really push uh, trace minerals and micronutrients and kind of building that biological system. Um, so we invest quite a bit of money in you know getting things where we want it. But uh, I'd say, I mean. Yeah, we have a lot more passes per acre, but you know, we're our our 
our inputs are probably a little bit more than a lot of conventional guys you know surprisingly a lot of people are like organic you just throw a seed out there and harvest it you know that's that but i mean our fertilizer budget's uh pretty high and it, i mean it pays and i've seen organic guys you know trying to skimp on fertility and you know they're the ones that have the 70 bushel corn so you know it's it if if you do it right uh, uh we have I think we might have our first 200 bushel corn this year. So, I mean, that's, you know, pr pretty good. I mean, the last few years, uh, we've, we've been, uh, we've been, you know, averaging 120, 140 bushel per acre outside of 2015. I mean, was a wreck for us because of super, super wet spring, but, uh, early on wet waterlogged soils definitely don't do the organic, uh, producer any favors. Uh, so, uh, from a nutritional, uh, nutrient standpoint, I mean, uh, we can grow as good as soybeans as anyone. And, uh, I mean, we, we've, we've been there, uh, to where, you know, we've been up to around 60 bushel beans, but I mean, mid forties to, uh, mid fifties is pretty common on beans, but, uh, uh, it takes an exceptional year to, you know, to get, to get up 180, 200 bushel corn. But I mean, a lot of years, I mean, we'll have fields that, you know, we can hit that 140, 150 pretty regularly. But, uh, yeah, it's just kind of the perfect, perfect setup on, uh, about, uh, we got about 130 acres that's, uh, came out of a legume and, uh, and, uh, we're doing some new things with, uh, we're actually top dressing, uh, uh, chicken litter whenever the corn's knee high and uh, cultivating it in right away and uh, getting really good use of our nitrogen that way and a lot less uh, uh, weed pressure by doing that rather than the, the pre-plant uh, uh, manure nitrogen application so uh, that that's working for us uh, I did quite a bit for Andy too and he's really Andy Ambrill that we're going to see next uh, we uh, I did uh, quite a bit for him too and uh, he's really happy with the result of you know what, what I spread uh, top dress his corn with so it was a pretty big investment we got a big commercial spreader and I spent about eight thousand dollars on wheel spacers and tires just hoping it'd work and it worked way better than I could even dream so uh, yeah it, it, it worked out pretty awesome so And, and something that I'm learning in sort of traditionally managed organic row crops where we have, you know, pre-plant plant tillage and cultivation to manage weeds, um, that initial couple of weeks after planting can really make or break a crop. It can really send it in two directions for, yeah. for high yield and productivity or yeah, mar that, marginal that's, that's yield. That's really crucial. And, I'm, and, you know, it comes back to weed control. I mean... Uh, we invest a lot of money in equipment to take care of weeds and uh, I mean that pays too. I mean there's some guys that think they can do it with an old Danish tine cultivator that they drug out of the weeds from 50 years ago and you know to have uh, we, we're on sub inch uh, guidance with our tractors so we plant and uh, cultivate on guidance and you know basically turn around at the end and you know we keep an, keep a lot better eye on things that way uh, run a power top link on our cultivator tractor so we can adjust the pitch of the cultivator from in the tractor and you know with, with running the guidance I mean you can just keep a constant eye on 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 your cultivator and uh, we can really get a lot closer to the to the row with our with our uh, cultivation equipment than you know just uh, just freewheeling it so that helps too and uh, and the corn I mean we flame every acre uh, foot foot taller less uh, we flame right down on the row, uh, whether it looks like it needs it or not, because uh, sometimes it might not need it. Uh, you don't think it needs it, and you're like, ah, oh, you know, if there's a little bit coming, we can cultivate. But there's been too many, uh, too many times where you don't flame, or you know, you mi miss that opportunity, and then it turns wet for two, three weeks, and then uh, it's too late to get what's in the row. So I mean, we the, the best time to get a weed is when you can't see it. Yep, correct. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we run a we run a hood over the row. It's a 14 inch hood, and then uh, the the burner goes straight down onto the the corn crop. So, uh, whenever the corn's small like that, the the energy is still underground. Uh, so the corn, I mean, it'll it'll look pretty sick for a few days, but it bounces bounces back in a hurry. So, uh, I mean, that's that's been one thing for us. I mean, there's 
I don't know. I guess we kind of started making that equipment because of just the lack of people making stuff that 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 works. So, uh, and, you know, like I said earlier, we're kind of working on some burner designs and stuff now to, you know, to where we can kind of make it make it our own. So and and go with that. And I don't I don't know how how much I want to be a in the business of making flamers, but uh, you know, if, if we can help a few guys out or whatever, and you know. Keep keep busy in the winter, yeah, doing some some welding and fab work like that. I guess, and then I don't have to eat ramen noodles so much. <laughs> Other questions? I want to wrap up here shortly, but now's your chance. <laughs> as far as the flamer, do you have your your own design, or are you using someone else's? Uh, we're working on our own design. One of my friends is an engineer, so. Uh, and we're kind of wanting to put a temp sensor on each burner and then an igniter, and so I don't know. Yeah, we're kind of kind of working on putting a, together our own design for that. So my point for that was to make sure you work on patents and everything else that you need to do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> I don't know. A lot of people say a patents. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I can always go back to. But seriously, you know, and you're also innovative anyway. I mean, farmers just are anyway. But you know, that, that's another. Value-added product, you know, you've done it. You may as well take the credit for it and, and look into some of those things, yeah. whether it's to you or other processes. But um, at least something to think about anyway. And then maybe other help through, I don't know, Farm Bureau or somebody else to, to help to help think about how that's done. So. Well, the USDA rule of development, that's the last you think about. Yeah. We're, we're just now on the borderline of being weird and, you know, mainstream, so. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, if there aren't other questions, let's, let's show our panel our appreciation.